Chapter 5 is concerned with understanding the execution time and memory efficiency of your PIC32 programs. And in this video, we're going to focus on execution time. And we're going to use a simple program down here called timing.c, and you'll see that that LED turns on, and then after a few seconds, it turns off again. And we're going to be using this program to help understand the timing properties of our programs. Uh, one simple way to time your program is to use the core timer. The core timer is a timer associated with the CPU. It's not one of your five peripheral timers. And it's a 32-bit counter, so it counts every two CPU cycles. So it, since our CPU is clocked at 12.5 nanoseconds or 80 megahertz, then every two cycles or 25 nanoseconds, it increases by one tick. And so we can use that to time code. And here's an example of code that uses the core timer. So we have something, we define two integers, elapsed ticks and elapsed nanoseconds. Then we use this uh, command here, cp0 set count. And that's going to set the count of the core timer to zero. And then we have the code that we want to time. And then after that, we do elapsed ticks equals cp0 get count. And that gets the number of counts of the, of the core timer. And then we multiply that by 25 to find out the amount of time that's elapsed in nanoseconds. Now, there's a little bit of time associated with setting the count and getting the count, maybe one or two extra assembly commands. So your timing may not be accurate to within less than, say, 50 nanoseconds. If the code you're trying to time runs on only tens or hundreds of nanoseconds, then your time may not be very accurate. So one thing you can do is you can run that code many times, and then uh, you get a much longer time, and you can divide to get the average and get a much more accurate estimate of the amount of time your code takes to run. So that's one way you could uh, estimate the time that your code takes to run. Another way is to simply use a wall clock if the code that you're timing takes long enough. And we're going to see that with timing.c uh, that you see running on the NU32 down here. So let's change to the timing directory. Oops. And take a look at what's in it. So right now there's a lot of stuff in the timing directory because I already made the timing.c program. Um, so I want to get rid of all of the elf files and the .o files that I created already. So one thing you can do is you can use make again. Just type make clean. And that gets rid of all of those intermediate files in the final um, hex files and L files. And if I take a look again at what's in the directory, uh, this is how we start all of our projects. We create a directory, in this case called timing. We copy the skeleton file contents into it. And then we create our new source code. So timing.c is the new source code associated with this project. So we have five files in this directory. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to edit the make file for this project because I want to get rid of optimizations. By default, our make file is using optimization level one. And just for the purposes of you know, explaining in these next couple of videos, I want to get rid of the optimization. So I'm going to open the make file. I'm going to look for the compiler flags. And here we see, oops, uh, here we see that we have this compiler flag minus 01. So that's choosing optimization level 1. I'm going to get rid of that so there's no optimizations in our build. And now I'm going to uh, go ahead and make the program now with no optimizations. And we can see what gets created here. Uh, we've created the uh, out.disassembly file that we'll be looking at later, the out.executable and linkable file, the out.hex file, which is the actual, actual executable, and out.map, which is a memory and space file that we're going to look at in the next video. So for now, we've made our out.hex, the executable, and you can see then you know, the object codes that are in intermediate outputs. But let's take a look at timing.c to see how it works so that we can now uh, understand what's happening in the execution down here. 
Okay, so we include NU32.h or NU32 library that we always use. We're going to find this constant called delay time at 50 million. Um, a couple of function prototypes, we'll see those in a second. Ignore these constants, and then we go down to main. Ignore these commands that are currently commented out. And in the main loop, in the main function, all we do is enter this infinite while loop where we delay and then we toggle the light, uh, which you see down here uh, with this light coming on and off periodically. So all we have to do is understand what delay is doing. So if we go down to delay, it enters this for loop that runs 50 million times because that's how we define delay time. And that's all it does. It runs through this for loop 50 million times and then it exits and then it toggles the light. Now the reason I turned off optimizations was because our, our uh, program might be smart enough to know, hey, this isn't actually doing anything, so just get rid of that delay. And then we wouldn't be able to see the flashing down here. So um, let's go ahead and run this and then see how long it takes uh, for this 50 million, uh, loop, 50 million loop to run. So we've saw, it's actually already running down here. So I'm going to use a Unix trick to time it. And I'm going to press enter when the light goes off to start timing. And then I'll stop timing when the light comes back on. OK, and this is what I get for the wall clock time, about 6.27 seconds. What I'm actually getting is uh, 6. 0.25 seconds. So it takes 6.25 seconds to run through that for loop 50 million times. So I can divide that by 50 million. And that's equal to 125 nanoseconds each time through the loop. Um, we know that each CPU cycle is 12.5 nanoseconds. So this means 10 CPU cycles to get through the loop. So we've used that trick of taking something that doesn't take very long to run that one time through the loop, and we did it 50 million times so that we could even use a wall clock to measure the amount of time that that loop takes. Now, there's something else we could do. We could look at the assembly file that was created when we did the compilation, and we could look at the number of commands that are in that uh, assembly file, and that would give us some idea of how long the function should take to run. So let's take a look at this file, this out.disassembly file that was created during the compilation by our make file. And I'm going to look for the function delay. And here it is. And now I've found the loop. And this is what the loop is doing. So um, if you see down here, there's this branch if not equal to zero command, and it's going to branch up to this address 9D0021D8, which is right here. And so the loop starts here and goes down to here and then con continues. We don't need to go through what the assembly is doing. Basically, it's adding one to I, it's loading in the number 50 million, it's comparing them, and then checking to see if it should exit the loop or not. So here's where the loop starts, right here, this line. And then it actually goes down through this no op. So let me uh, just highlight those. This branch if not equal command actually has to execute the no op before it completes. So if we count the number of assembly commands, there are nine. There are nine within the loop. And we've already done with our wall clock timing, seeing that there's 10 CPU cycles. So it's almost one assembly command per CPU cycle. Okay. So uh, that's good. So that means that our prefetch cache is overcoming any delays that have to do with pulling instructions from flash memory uh, so that it can execute essentially one command every CPU cycle or almost because we see that there's nine assembly commands. Right. OK, so um, one thing we could do is we could go back to our program. And then I could go down and I could turn off, I could uncomment these two commands here. 
Now this first comment, or this uh, first command here, this built-in MTC0, don't worry about the, the syntax for it. It's a compiler built-in command. That turns off the cache, so that prevents any uh, instructions being stored in cache. And then this second instruction here would turn off the prefetch capability. Remember that the prefetch capability is the ability of the program to run ahead and pull instructions before they're needed. Now this gets defeated when there is a conditional because it doesn't know what happens after the conditional, so the prefetch stops working. In any case, if we turned off the cache and we turned off the prefetch both, then we'd find that it takes about 17 seconds for the light to toggle instead of 6.25 seconds, or 27 CPU cycles. And if we remember that we have nine assembly commands, it's taking three CPU cycles per assembly command, and that makes sense because uh, we know that it takes three CPU cycles to pull something from flash if it's not already sitting in the prefetch cache. And that's because the maximum frequency of the flash is 30 megahertz, while the CPU is running at 80 megahertz.